welcome to a new episode of the podcast Bridging Voices from the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung in Brussels. Um, today uh, we're joined by three uh, speakers, experts on the Sahel region. Um, to my left I have Ulf Lessing, who is the head of the Sahel program for the Konrad Adenauer um, Stiftung in Bamako. Um, to the right I have Sadiq Abba, who is a Sahel and Lake Chad Basin expert based in Paris. And further to my left, I have Delina Gojo, who is Associate Fellow at the Egmont Institute and PhD candidate at Scuola Normale, who is currently based in Niamey. And my name is Nina Willen, and I'm the Africa Director for the Egmont Institute and Associate Professor at Lund University. So we're going to talk a little bit about stabilization efforts in the Sahel region at large. Um, Delina, I will start with you. You just uh, authored a new report for the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung on stabilization efforts. Um, and we talk a lot about stabilization, European efforts to stabilize the Sahel. Could you just develop that a little bit? Are we stabilizing the Sahel? Thank you, Nina, for the question and uh, welcome, everyone. Um, I think uh, the the Sahel the, the new Sahel strategy is a 2021 uh, document that mentions the word stabilization or friends of it unstable stabilizing about 20 times. Um, but then, is the European Union truly stabilizing in the Sahel? Um, with this report, we wanted to analyze um, what stabiliz European stabilization efforts look like in the Sahel from the region and specifically from Niger. Um, and the main idea behind this new European stabilization is one of shifting the burden of fighting uh, and the burden of responsibility almost entirely onto partner forces from a security point of view and onto local elites, which are ultimately imagined as being responsible for the stability of their state, while at the same time supporting development, humanitarian act actions and a reform of Sahelian states. However, this approach is rather low stake um, and incurs in problems of its own. And it ultimately, I believe, um, ends up being more ambitious than it is presented. So the core principle of European stabilization in the current conflict context in the Sahel is by, with and through, which is um, a definition that, that comes from uh, American stabilization era. Um, and to put it in the words of a European diplomat, um, we do not want to win hearts and minds in the Sahel. Uh, we want to make the state more appealing to citizens. We want them to choose their own state rather than terrorist groups or criminality or migration, and, and I'm quoting. Basically, we should be on the sidelines. Um, this is the first and, according to our analysis in this report, the most dire difficulty European missions are facing within the region itself. Um, a stabilizing approach that prioritizes local ownership is effective only if consequences are seen on the ground. And currently, we don't see these consequences on the ground. Mm. Thank you, Delina. So you were talking a little bit about the local population and how the local population in these states need to um, want to choose their own state and need to, to gain trust again in their own states. How, how do you think that this is happening or how is that developing right now? Um, Sedik, do you see that the population wants to to um, build new states or, or, or to regain the trust in the state, or, or what is the feeling like? Yes, as uh, Delina said, I think uh, the situation, before going to stabilization, we have to retablish the situation. Now, if you go in Sahel, uh, the group terrorists take power than the state. Uh, they are organized, they are progressing in Sahel area. First, they start by Mali, and after Mali, they go to Niger, to Burkina Faso. Now they are going to other country, Gulf of Guinea area, like uh, Bene, like uh, Togo, uh, like uh, Ghana. Uh, the tourist uh, group is progressing in Sahel and the other country of West Africa. And the population are a little bit disappointed because uh, they see the support coming from outside. They say, if you take the case of uh, many Sahelian uh, opinion, they say, we don't, we cannot understand country like, uh, uh, I say like France, uh, like uh, other country of New European give us support and we didn't succeed. There is a problem. 
we didn't succeed. The terrorist group is continuing to progress in, and we have partner who have the very strong army of the world, who have uh, uh, the very technology, the very new technology, but we didn't succeed. This kind of disappointment between population and the state and their own state first and the partner of their state, we have to look if we don't, if we want to succeed in the uh, fighting with, uh, against terrorists in Sahel. I think this is a challenge for us as Sahelian and is a challenge for our partners. If we want to, we cannot succeed without the support of population. Even if the military area, without all the support of population, we cannot succeed. Now we, there is a kind of uh, block of the confidence between Sahelian population and their state and between Sahelian population and the partner of Africa, of uh, Sahelian and other country. We have to, I think we have to think uh, uh, to find a better way to put the partnership in a way of uh, succeed. If we didn't succeed, it will be a very, very big challenge for all the world, not only for Sahelia. Right. Um, you're talking about how there is um, how there is a Western presence in the Sahelian countries, and we know that there is quite a few European states present in the Sahel um, for the past few years. So why, uh, why do you think that the EU or the European states should care about Sahel? Um, Ulf. Um, thank you, Lina, and uh, welcome, everybody. The Sahel is very important for, for Europe. I mean, it's one of the poorest regions, uh, but at the same time, it has uh, probably the, the fastest population growth. The population is supposed to double by 2050, but there's no, there are no states who are able to receive all these uh, newcomers. You know, the schools are mostly closed. Uh, no jobs available. The only option for, for many young people is either you know joining the jihadist terrorist group or migrate within Africa, which is then destabilizing other countries like uh, on the coast, like Cote d'Ivoire, or try to go to Europe. So we, we have a you know you know a core interest in, in trying to stabilize uh, the Sahel region and. The other reason why we should be doing more is it's also some kind of new uh, front line, the Cold War. I mean, Putin and Russia is not just uh, expanding in, in Europe, but it's also very active in, in the Sahel region. Like, you know, Russia has formed a military agreement with, with Mali, has deployed uh, Wagner mercenaries, and is now also trying to uh, Establish a footprint in Burkina Faso and other regions. It's exploiting anti French, anti Western sentiment. And this is an, yet another reason for us not to forget about the Sahel region. It's not just some kind of outpost in Africa, what we don't know much about. It's, it's, it's our core interest to, to be active there, trying to help the population and also, you know, confronting Russia a bit so they don't basically take over the whole region. Right, so you're you're um, you're talking about two different goals. There, one is to stabilize the region for the local population, so that there is a region where the local population do want to invest in their own states and do want to to stay. If we're going to put it um, straightforward here, um, but then you're also talking about this expanding terrorism, like uh, Sedik was talking about, how this is going down towards the Gulf of Guinea, different type of um, violent extremist organizations. And, and you were also talking a little bit about the, um, the presence of Russian, both the Russian state, but also Russian mercenaries, which is a sort of um, plausible deniability because so far um, the Russian state is, is not really uh, confirming that they have Russian mercenaries, but we do know that they have that in Mali. Um, how do you see um, the role of the EU or the role of the European states in this sort of broader um, let's say, game uh, between the, the different states. There are on the one hand, is there are the Sahelian states who now have alternative partners uh, like Russia, and then you have the European states um, who are there and who wants to stay there, who want to, to be a stabilizing factor in these um, Sahelian states. We have talked a bit about conditionality in uh, the European strategy and about how 
how are we going to to stay on our conditions and on on the local population's conditions is there is there a way to to stay that makes everybody more or less happy Ladina? yeah 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 very very good question um i think i have a warning on this and i suppose i mean i, I suppose it's uh It, it could be useful for the European Union uh, to think about this more, and European member states as well. Um, the warning is not to consider the good neighbor in the bad neighborhood, which in, in this case uh, is Niger, obviously, which is the last uh, Sahelian country um, that retains very positive diplomatic relations with European member states. Um, not to consider it a, a, a panacea, not to consider it the state that is going to solve everything, its own and at the same time also for the European Union to be aware that there is a negotiating power that is now in the hands of Nigerian president uh, Mohamed Bazoum um, which is so much tr stronger than it used to be and so being aware of this will help the European Union make political choices and potentially impose conditionality mechanisms that could be useful further down the line so just being aware of of the fact that there is a possibility to be manipulated, there is a possibility to receive a lot of asks and and to, to get a lot of asks and receive very, very little in return. Mm. I think uh, you're highlighting an important point there that um, the Sahelian governments are um, capable and, and, and very well aware of the, their own positions in this uh, broader international arena and that they're also very well aware of the different possibilities they, they have to negotiate with their partners. And we've seen that uh, particularly in Mali, where the Malian Junta, and, and for the listeners who, who are not aware of, of this, we should perhaps also um, remind them that there has been a coup epidemic in this region where we've seen several of the states, um, Mali, Chad and Burkina Faso, Uh, suffer coups, um, uh, several coups uh, over the past two years. Um, and we've also seen that uh, France, which was one of the main partners of Mali, has now left Mali for, for several different reasons, one of them being this uh, double coup, a coup within the coup in Mali, but also deteriorating relations on a diplomatic and a military level um, between Mali and, and um, France. How, how do you see this development, Ulf, and what do you see, how do you see France's role in the region more broadly? Uh, I think uh, France's withdrawal is, is a chance for the other European Union members to step up to the engagement. So far we uh, followed blindly the French. French has done much for the region, but they're the only one who are really willing to fight terrorists, whereas the Euro other Europeans were maybe training or doing other stuff behind the scenes. But uh, also France is, is now facing really, you know, uh, many, many problems in the region due to its role as former colonial power, also because its, its policies are rejected by, uh, by many in the Sahel region, not just in, in Mali, but also in other countries. I mean, this diplomatic escalation between Mali and France, to which both sides contributed, also the Mali, it's not just the French, has really... Uh, upset not just Malians but people in general in the in the region so they're they're, they're less welcome there and this is now a chance for the other Europeans who kind of you know let just France take the lead and follow behind to be a more active role and also really you know engage themselves countries like 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 Germany or you know, Italy or other you know European Union members who don't have a colonial past in the region, they're really seen as, as neutral and it's, it's up to us, up to, for them to, to play a bigger role and to replace the French, which sooner or later will be probably also, you know, scaling down their engagement in other countries. Mm. Yeah, we have already seen that France is withdrawing from Mali and also dimini diminishing the number of troops that they have in the region more broadly. There have been um, discussions about increasing the collaboration with Burkina Faso, but we've also seen that uh, during the last coup uh, in Burkina Faso just two months ago, um, there were also anti-French uh, feelings that were on display, um, Russian flags that were also waved in, in different demonstrations. Um, how do you see this uh, growing anti-French sentiment uh, in the region? Uh, yes, uh, 
before going through to the, the question, I think uh, we have to highlight that the uh, European Union is doing very good thing in Sahel. We are not uh, negative with them. They are doing many good things. If you take uh, AUTM, European Mission Training for uh, Military in Mali, they train uh, more than 30,000 uh, mil uh, milit Malian mil military troops uh, and Europe, um, uh, Europe uh, Sahel Mali, Ecap Sahel Niger, they are doing good. But they, they can do better. They can do better. Our expectation is them to do better in the training, to do better in other things. And if they do, it can, can, it can help to, uh, uh, to more understand what the European Union is doing in Sahel. Now, in a large part of the Sahelian opinion, they are looking what France is doing as European. But as we have to, to maybe to dis distinct uh, to put a distinction between France and the rest of uh, country of uh, uh, of uh, European Union, uh, many uh, there is a historical reasons of for reject of France because of colonialism, but there is a very mistake made by French uh, uh, authority when they speak uh, with Malian, what their attitude sometimes. Uh, uh, suggests a kind of neocolonialism. And now, uh, if you take uh, Sahelian area, there are very many young people who didn't know the relationship between France and uh, Mali or other country uh, when uh, at the colonialism. They don't know. For them, France is equal with Mali. They cannot support what is uh, what their, their old grandparents support. And uh, the, you see demonstration. We see uh, the the go to French embassy, to French uh, uh, cultural center, and other to, pro to to protest. I think France uh, make uh, many mistake. Uh, after Mali, we see after the coup of Burk in Burkina Faso, uh, the Russian flags. Uh, people uh, called for uh, Russia, Russia because they are they are kind of disappointed. Man. Uh, people are disappointed. They didn't have, uh, you, you, you know, um, after Serval, maybe we have to explain uh, to people, uh, when, when Serval start in 2014, people receive uh, Serval with, ta with uh, music, with other things. And uh, ten, day, 10 years after, what happened? What happened? Today people are putting told on, on France, uh, 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 ten years ago, they 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 they, they welcome France with uh, something miss, uh, and I think France didn't manage it very uh, efficiently. And today, the uh, the anti-France uh, feeling is growing uh, more than Mali is coming uh, in Burkina Faso, even in Niger. Uh, there is a small in in the opinion there is a reject of France. I think. France himself have to stay and think what happened, what 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 happened. We can and how we can change with uh, this way. Uh, France have to do to do that. Right. Yes. Um, there are growing anti-French sentiments in in the region, and as you mentioned, there have been mistakes um, by the French decision makers. But we also have to remember then that we. The environment, the security environment has been changing, but also the political environment. So now we're not talking about any, um, We, as Delina was pointing out, we only have Niger now in this region, which is, still has a democratic credibility. So we're also talking about uh, military juntas who are now engaging with the European states and with France. And that's also, of course, changing the report between and the relations between um, France and the Europeans and, and the Sahelian uh, governments. Um, you were mentioning earlier about um, about uh, France being the driving force in the Sahel, and you said the same thing, that there needs to be a distinction between the, the French intervention and the European interventions, but so far there hasn't been any other European state ready to step up and actually to sacrifice troops, because we should also remember that, that France has been willing to maintain and sustain 
a military operation for over nine years, which has cost uh, quite a lot of money and which has also meant a, a big sacrifice in, in troops killed. Um, so far, we haven't seen any willingness from any other European states to do the same. Uh, Delina, do you think that there is a possibility that, that other European states or the EU as an institution is willing to step in and, and take over that leading role, um, driving the, the further uh, relationship with the Sahelian states? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Nina. I suppose, I suppose the answer is no. At this moment, I think the answer is no, even if uh, France has left Mali and Mali has been defined a thousand times as the epicenter of all the violence. I mean, if violence isn't stemmed in Mali, it cannot be stopped anywhere else. We will just lower the, the threshold of violence, which is what current efforts in Niger are, are seeking to do. I mean, it's just maintaining it under a, under a certain threshold. So even if France has now left Mali and it, it has left uh, rather... <laughs> Um, rather dramatically, uh, following diplomatic tensions, uh, following uh, a series of, of escalations on a number of fronts, um, I don't see any willingness on the part of any European state. And I don't see any willingness, not just on the most risk-taking uh, activity, which is uh, security activity, going into the front lines accompanying uh, Nigerian, Malian, uh, Burkina Bay troops, but also from a from a development humanitarian political level there doesn't and and i think this is the the core of, of the problem for me and i'm not suggesting uh, i think it would be quite hard to suggest uh, throwing in more more troops into the region but i think the core of the problem is the way we distance ourselves from what is happening in the region so even from a from a diplomatic point of view i mean simply put um, there was a, there was an event a couple of months ago in Niger uh, in the north in a fairly stable area, uh, which is the region of Agadez. Uh, I mean, there is some trafficking happening, but there is a level of banditism, criminality. But overall, um, there are no terrorist groups, for example, uh, in the north. So there was this event called Akur Saleh, where a number of uh, pastoralists uh, from all over the country gather and is a is a huge festival, is a celebration, is is a beautiful event. Um, European diplomats, uh, instead of showing up and staying for a couple of days in one of the most culturally significant um, events in the country, came for a few hours. I mean, it was come and go. And this kind of thing shows, it, it gives such a strong signal of our unwillingness to risk anything. I mean, it's, it's almost, I, I can almost define it laziness. There doesn't seem to be any desire to truly understand what is happening in the country. So you're asking for, I think you're asking for what has been asked during the past 20 years if for all types of interventions, a better understanding of what's happening on the ground and more um, local uh, understanding and, and, and a better idea of the local context more, more, more broadly. Um, do you want to, to yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yes, uh, elaborate uh, on he, that, Sadiq? Uh, yes, uh, the leader point uh, very strong for me. As a Sahelian, something is very important. It's not very anecdotic when they come and they go. <laughs> People are looking like kind of uh, uh, the, the strong is not support. If they, they come with other officials, they stay for all the festival. It can kind of, it's kind of signal. They give a signal. Uh, now thing is going better. You cannot put more money, enough money and give a bad signal. For, for, for Sahelian people, this is a bad signal. They cannot live with us. Uh, the risk is for us and the no risk is for them. When they come, they go. This kind of uh, uh, attitude, I think it uh, can block uh, feeling and it can affect the, the, the partnership. It is, it is very important for Sahelian. You know, before the Sahel crisis, there is a, a air... The, 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 there is company who is coming from Marseille to Agadez directly, without going to Paris, without going to Niamey directly. People are, hope, are have the hope that one day we, we will return to this kind of, uh, of situation. If we, we, we give support, you have to, to, to 
to come at the festival, to rest at the festival with other, it can give uh, hope mm-hmm. to the people of the Sahelian area. It can be a kind of hope. Mm-hmm. They feel uh, now the situation is going better and one day Sahel will be normal as other country. Mm-hmm. And uh, can I just add something here? Um, on on, um, on on what what is happening in Niamey? I mean, all of this just plays so much into what Ulf uh, was talking about earlier. And so this whole Russian presence that is very much worrying European policymakers, I mean, what is a way to counteract this level of misinformation and conspiracy theories? Is presence. Mm-hmm. And, and the things people are saying in Niamey, like in, 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 the, in the middle of Niger, about the European uh, civilian training mission, which is called EUCAP Niger, um, they're saying we never see them. These people are here, they have a huge base, mm-hmm. and they're never in town. Who are these people? What are they doing in our country? I mean, this plays so well into the hands of those that want to, um, to build ideas around how Europeans and French uh, people are in the Sahel just uh, steal resources and in this new neo-colonial fashion, and it's not helping anyone. So there is an easy breeding ground, let's say, for conspiracy theories and for um, especially Russian trolls that we know that they have really tried to instrumentalize this um, feeling, the anti-French sentiment and the more and more anti-Western sentiment. Um, and that, that what you're both saying here is that that's, that's making it facilitated by the fact that many of the European states are not that present in the daily lives of the local population. And Ulf, do you want to develop uh, on this a little yeah, bit further? I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a general problem with European diplomats that if, if you want to have a career in the foreign service, if you go to Africa, that's, that's not your, your first choice. Uh, it's, it's just the way African countries or Sahelian countries are seen in Europe uh, yeah, it's uh, in Germany. It, it, you know, there's a framing. It's called A B C country. <laughs> you know, a would be Washington or Paris or Brussels. C would be probably Niamey or, or Bamako. It seems as this hardship post where a few people want to go. And uh, uh, yeah, there's certainly security reasons why people or diplomats can't go out, can't travel as much as they like. They, I know I have friends who really want to do more. They can't, but it's also a bit of an attitude problem. Many just stay there for for like for two years, and uh, you know since it's a hardship posting, you know they're almost almost abroad from you know going abroad on holidays and they're actually being in the country. So it's it's not a very you know attractive posting. Many just see it as a duty. Two years in Mali, okay. After all, to get a cozy post in, in, in London or in Berlin, and that that all contributes probably also to the perception of the Sahelians that the, the Europeans are not present at all. But having said that, there are really security questions. I myself, I really would like to travel more inside Mali, also Niger or Burkina Faso. It's just getting so dangerous with the kidnapping risk that also certainly contributes to the perception that we mm-hmm. Europeans are not being seen as present by, by locals. And, and whenever we can go, I mean, whenever Europeans are allowed to go into certain areas, even in places where, again, I, I again want to highlight this, almost virtually no danger other than banditism in the north of Niger, and we still have to be accompanied by a military escort. And there are areas in the country where military escorts, I mean, the, the military forces are not perceived as doing more good than harm. So obviously, as, as Europeans, constantly being accompanied by a military escort doesn't really help much. So thank you. I think we've, um, to sum up this first part of the podcast, we talked about the importance of understanding the local context much better and integrating with the local population We've talked about what stabilization means and that there is a wide uh, range of different interpretations of of what stabilization can and and could or should mean. And we've also talked about the coup epidemics and how that has changed the political environment. And we've talked about how terrorist groups have expanded over the past decade in spite of um, the rather large Western military presence in the region. We talked a little bit about the Western presence in the Sahel uh, region and how it has not really lived up to the expectations of the local population and probably not either um, the expectations from the European or the Western population so far. 
And um, one of the one of the points that have been highlighted in many reports and by analysts is the lack of strategic communication both towards the local population but also back towards um, the host nations. And um, how do you see this point, Delina? You mentioned um, either Yunina or or Sedik uh, earlier. You you were talking about uh, Serval and uh, the the the. Um, the beginning of Serval, what the French mission uh, that was launched in 2012, I believe, um, what that mission meant and how how was that mission successful? Um, and I think the, I mean, the, the, the situation with Barkhan and after 10 years of Barkhan, I suppose we can now reflect on what the problems with it were and how not to make the same mistakes again in terms of communication, um, is that Serval was a consequential progressive liberation of villages that was very well communicated daily to the Malian public and to European publics and the French public especially. So daily there were there were information on which village Serval had liberated um, from from a number of armed groups uh, and how people were were reacting to it. With Barkhan, the situation was and is still much more much murkier, is much more complicated to, to understand how the mission is functioning. Um, the, the only thing that I believe people see, um, not just in Yemen, but of course in, in border areas, in, in more remote villages, is a number of troops coming every so often to do CIMIC, so civilian military cooperation, every so often, you know, they, they build a well or they hand in flour um, or, you know, food items, um, and this is all that people see. Um, and then the things that people hear is that weapons are being delivered daily. There is a presence of American armed drones in the north. Um, France has huge aerial power, and yet people keep dying. And so they just wonder, I mean, everyone is here with all this manpower and technology and money, and we keep dying. Why is that happening? What, what is and, and no one, European forces, the French, the Nigerians themselves, uh, in terms of government, struggle to communicate why it is so hard to actually protect these populations in border areas. That should be done better. Mm -hmm. So better strategic communication, and we also know that Barkhan, at, at some point, they, their strategic communication was also communicating how many jihadists or how many violent extremists um, persons that were killed or eliminated or neutralized, whatever word you want to use, and um, which didn't really perhaps send the message that was uh, expected and wanted by the local population, because there were, yes. of course, many other aspects, as you said, by CIMIC operations that were hardly known outside of the village where they were conducted. And um, we, you also talked about uh, the... Um, the strong technological presence uh, of weapons, of uh, different types of drones and so on. But the European states up until very recently have not been able to provide any lethal equipment until very recently when we had um, the European Peace Facility, which is a new instrument um, from which the European states can actually provide lethal equipment to their partner states. Um, how do you see this development, Ulf? Is this a blessing or a curse for the Europeans? No, I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's definitely in you know, progress. I mean, in Mali we had for almost 10 years uh, a European Union training mission for the Malian army where you know, the Malians were trained with uh, branches from trees and uh, wooden guns because uh, the Europeans didn't want any uh, take any risk. So, some, I knew some soldiers who actually want to train with guns, but they were stopped by their superiors for political reasons. So that was seen really as a failure, and everybody knew it, but we are still continuing to do this, you know, sending more, you know, European trainers every year, and also not giving the, the Malians what they wanted. They also wanted someone to, you know, you know work with them after the training, and that, that gave an opening to the Russians who said, here, forget about these. European jokers, here's the real stuff. We have the Kalashnikov, we give you, we give you the ammunition, and, you know, the planes, whatever you need, we also fight with you. We don't want to do what the, the Russians are doing in Mali, definitely not. But now with this European peace facility, we have an instrument where we can actually do a bit more realistic training and, you know, being taken seriously. You know, when, if you train someone with a wooden gun, what does it give you? It basically says, yeah, I don't trust this person with a gun, but now, with this 
new instrument. There, there is a way for us to, you know, train forces, you know, you know, appropriately, and you know, hopefully, this is a way forward. There are definitely also challenges. You know, we don't want lesser weapons to end, you know, in, in the arms of, uh, in the hands of, uh, of, of security forces who commit, you know, human rights violations, but. At least, you know, the Europeans are willing to take a, you know, more realistic approach. We we do know already that the EPF, so the European Peace Facility, has already delivered arms and equipment to the the FAMA, the the armed forces in Mali, but had to suspend it at one point because they were also used together with uh, Wagner, the Russian mercenary. So we do know that there are control mechanisms in place for the EPF, but we also know that there has been quite a lot of criticism towards this instrument for the risk of working um, with armed forces that commit uh, atrocities towards their own local populations. And exactly on this, Nina, yes, there is, <laughs> there is, I mean, everyone has their eyes on Mali. So again, there is very much a, a, a level of control onto what happens with, uh, with the Bamako government. I wouldn't say that there is the same level of scrutiny uh, with regard to Niamey, for example. So the 25 million, and again, I mean, compared to the money that Europe is uh, giving to Ukraine, much like a Nigerian um, government official say, this is just peanuts. But still, this amount of money that uh, has ended up buying equipment for uh, the FAM, the, the Nigerian armed forces, I seeing what the monitoring and evaluation of humanitarian and development projects in remote areas is, I would say almost equal to none. I mean, it isn't good enough. It isn't, uh, it, it isn't trustworthy enough, I find. I wonder the level of scrutiny and monitoring and evaluation that there would be with, uh, with equipment, with lethal equipment. So I, I think this is, a, I mean, I agree with Ulf uh, that it was a long time coming, but I struggle to believe that there is going to be the same level of attention in Niger that uh, there has been with Mali. So what you're saying that there is a, there is a risk that the uh, scrutiny will be harder in places where we know that there have been more atrocities than in yeah. places um, where we, we don't have the same statistics. Mm -hmm. um, so the idea is then, of course, that the control mechanism should be applied to the same extent wherever it, they are um, being provided. But we're talking about Mali, we're talking about Niger, and now we're, there is also discussion about a new European um, mission in Niger that will be more about logistics. Um, we know that there have been discussions about more European missions uh, starting up in the region at large. But how do we see more of a regional, local approach? We know that the G5 uh, Sahel um, is, is faltering, uh, let's, let's be honest. It's, it's one of these initiatives that we don't really see going anywhere, especially not since Mali withdrew from the G5 Sahel. Do we see any other opening for a regional approach to, this, um, to the problems that we're facing now? Yes, uh, I think the, the build the G5 Sahel in the intention to have a regional approach because what we know and what we find out is that no country can by his only self ag war against these terrorists. They are in Niger, they are in Burkina Faso. If the country is now working together, they cannot succeed. You see, they attack Niger and they go back to Burkina Faso, they attack Burkina to go back to Niger. And the country decide to fight them together. They decide if one country is attacked, he can follow terrorists 15 uh, kilometer in the in the other country. This is one thing uh, bring by G5 Sahel, and I think what we are seeing now is making that the only way to succeed is to work together. Sahelian country and Gulf de Guinea countries they have to to work together. Uh, the Sahelian Sahelian country have just G5 Sahel even if uh, it's not working. For me, the, the G5 Sahel uh, is the problem, uh, have a link between the problem with France and Mali. As you know, uh, the head of staff summit have to take place in Mali, and the other country decide not to go to Bamako, and there is an uh, internal crisis in G5 Sahel. But uh, uh, I hope, and uh, many, many, uh, people in Sahel area 
call for the uh, G5 Sahel to come back uh, to Mali to come back in G5 Sahel and continue fi- fighting against terrorists if the G5 Sahel uh, take his uh, place and the now they build a initiative Dakra you see uh, Accra initiative which is regrouping uh, uh, Gulf de Guinea country like uh, Benin uh, Côte d'Ivoire Ghana uh, Togo they will have a join with G5 Sahel and initiative Dakra to build a regional response because this crisis now be, is a regional crisis and we have we have no choice the re, the, the response the good response will be regional and i think the country and the african leaders of this area they have in mind that they have to build a regional response if they want to succeed if, even the country like nigeria cannot succeed if he is alone but if we work together we can build something which can help us to succeed against the this terrorist group in sahel and in gulf de guinea mm. yes thank you um g5 sahel has also been somewhat ironically called g5 or g3 sahel or g2 sahel because there hasn't been a very cohesive um feeling in between the states there have also been troubles that they haven't let uh, the other countries enter uh, over the borders and and so on so there have been troubles even between the different countries and um, do you see that this will change uh, with the new accra initiative ulf or delina is there something do you see that there is a new uh, development or how how should we see the new regional approaches taking place in the in the I mean, cell i mean it's it's uh, it, it's a positive step that uh, this accra initiative g5 it didn't really work out it was 2014 you know created or you know by the you know five Sahelian countries with a strong support from France also Germany you now with this difficult relationship with the French so this uh, you know it, it, it doesn't work as a format anymore it never really took off you know and also the terrorists they've moved on they you know they reach the coast now they're doing almost you know, every week you see attacks now in, in Cote d'Ivoire and Togo or Benin so it's good to you know integrate the uh, the coastal countries and see uh, what will happen. The key question will be what's happening in Burkina Faso. There is now that we have had just a second uh, military coup. You know the, uh, the the military is is divided. And uh, when I went uh, to, to Niger recently to to visit special forces, they also told me that the Burkina don't you know cooperate with the Nigerians anymore. For, Mainly for the reason they lost control of the northern part of the country, where terrorists really really active, and it's also very sensitive to have like you know cooperation with foreign troops in Burkina Faso, for him was for like Thomas um, Sankara and its legacy. So that it, the whole Accra initiative will, will stand and fall with a Burkina Faso, where the terrorists are based, from where they are using the territory to you know go to the south to the coastal countries. <laughs> Will cooperate or not, but in any case, it's a good step to have the Gulf of Guinea countries involved and you know try again to set up a new new regional approach. So the fact that we're already now talking about the Gulf of Guinea before um, we know that there have been expansion of, of uh, terrorist attacks or violent extremist attacks to Togo Benin during the past year. Um, and already now there are discussions about how to prevent that expansion further. Do we see a different future for this uh, Gulf of Guinea? Can we be more positive about the development uh, there? What do you think, Delina? I want to push back a little bit on, in, in, onto uh, something that Ulf uh, was mentioning in terms of ownership and the G5, when the G5, the joint force, was created. Um, I I think, I mean, from from what we read of uh, how the process worked at the time, it is true that there was a strong European push to create this regional force. But the perception, I think, was that Sahelian states themselves believed that a regional solution was the solution. And yet, there wasn't enough, and, and, and I wonder why that is. And I don't think the answer is... Um, that there was a strong European push, but rather it was a very much internal problem in terms of in terms of trust. I mean, the Malian government trusting the Nigerian government 
uh, trusting the Burkinabe and the Chadians. So there seemed to be a Sahelian problem into even the human resources that were put into the joint force. No one was sending their best officials. No one was sending their best security officials. It seemed like there was no political will to, 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 to base their own security onto the security of, of, a, of a partner country, uh, country in the region. And, of course, coup after coup, uh, I mean, the situation could only deteriorate. So I think with the Accra initiative, as with every as with every partnership, every military partnership, if there is no trust in the other government, uh, if there is no trust even in the stability of a partner government, I mean, if I, as a Nigerian policymaker, uh, believe that uh, the Beninois uh, are not going, that the Beninois at this present moment are not going to last another mandate, or not even their own mandate, then why would I risk sending my best people into an area that I'm not directly concerned with. Mm. And we also know that the G5 Sahel, often the, the battalions that were supposed to go to G5 Sahel, they were withdrawn for because there were national problems or there were things happening uh, on, on their own territory and all of a sudden there was then G3. Um, so, so as you say, there hasn't been uh, enough trust between the different Sahelian governments to actually uh, build this G5 Sahel sufficiently and, and build the trust necessary between the countries. So we are now looking at the Accra initiative and we're wondering if this is going to, to have a different outcome um, than G5 Sahel. And so far we also know that there are more European interests, I would say, for the Gulf of Guinea than there has been for Mali, Niger and Burkina Faso, mostly because there are um, more commercial interests for the European states in this region. Um, do you see uh, Germany, for example, becoming more interested in developing a closer partnership with the Gulf of Guinea states um, in this regard? Yeah, I mean, I think that there's a real concern, you know, Germany and other European countries, you know, if the crisis now really uh, hits uh, in full the, 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 you know, the coastal countries such as Cote d'Ivoire, Benin, Togo or Senegal, which are not just trading partners, but they're really much more stable, much more you know developed countries. Then, then we're really talking about the stability of the whole West Africa. With Sahel, Mali, people tend to say, okay, these you know desert countries, semi-arid, you know, they were always poor. So I mean, that's not a big deal. But now, I mean, the real deal from European perspective, if you know, if if the coastal countries also get Destabilized. It's we have a really, really crisis at hand, and you know this will, you know, trigger new migration flows or also pose security threats. So that's uh, that's why I think you know there's there's been alarm now in European capital what's going on that they can't ignore the problem anymore on the Sahel or really have to step up the game and really you know try to do as much to you know contain the crisis. You know not to reach it more to the coastal countries. Right, and Sedek, you earlier you were talking about the importance of of not letting the whole Western um, West West Africa fall, because if if West Africa fall into the hands of violent extremist organization, then you said Europe is also likely to fall. Um, how how do you see this development? What do you how do you see the connections between yes. the two? Yes, I think it's uh, very important for European country to continue to help to help better Sahelian and West Africa. As you know, in the uh, context of uh, the Ukraine war, people in Sahel see uh, European helping very high uh, Ukraine. And Ukraine is one country, but Sahel and, uh, and, uh, uh, and West Africa is uh, about uh, 16 countries, more than 16 countries, remember? The expectation is big. They say they can help Ukraine. They can do this for Ukraine and not so for us. If they want to uh, rebuild the confidence between partners in the partnership between Sahelian and uh, 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 European country, I think they have to do more. They have to do better because it's the interest of Sahel, but it's the interest of uh, uh, European countries too. Uh, if we take the side of uh, migration, if you want to people to to stay in Sahel country, you have to give them uh, a hope, perspective. They have uh, young. If you take uh, the the terrorist group in Sahel, 
the the argument to recruit young is come with the we will give you job they they give it they because uh, they normally in the country they haven't young uh, when they finish the school they haven't your job they stay home and the tourist group come take them to to uh, to take them back and give them job if we want to fight against illegal migration like uh, europe is on european agenda we have to stabilize sahel we have to give hope to this country we have even we have to if it is the climate change and other thing if we don't do more for sahelian country uh, european agenda will not succeed ab- against control of immigration about control of, of security is my point of view thank you um, i think we should also debunk this myth about m- migration from the sahel being a security threat to europe um, so far there hasn't been any real security uh, concern uh, coming from the migration from the sahelian countries what we can see is migration from any of the african states have become a political problem for the european um, states because of a, a discussion and, and a debate about um which country should host uh, migrants but i think it's important to emphasize that this has so far not become uh, any type of security problem per se but i can hear um from all of us uh, that there is a need to maintain our focus on the sahelian uh, countries um you made the comparison with ukraine if if we can invest that much in a country can we then not do more for the sahelian states and we talked about the importance of stabilizing however we define stabilizing and i think that in your report uh, delina that you wrote together with your co-author selina you made an important point to talk that stabilization is not just about military uh, control and um, but it's also about political accountability uh, and good governance so i think we'll end the podcast here and say thank you so much for a very interesting discussion thank you nina thank you, thank you nina